Being an oil rig worker at sea is risky work. In spite of strict safety regulations, dangerous weather and the ongoing threat of the ocean mean that safety can never be taken for granted. On platforms, there have been a number of tragic accidents over the years. Even among those who have no connection to the sector, names like Piper Alpha, Ocean Ranger and Seacrest are ingrained in many people's minds. Perhaps since it occurred before the other disasters, Alexander L. Keeland is a name that is frequently forgotten. The incident, which was actually the worst industrial accident in Norwegian history, and a significant turning point for safety in the Norwegian oil and gas industry, should never be forgotten. The Alexander L. Keeland platform was being used as a housing platform for 212 workers in March 1980. It was anchored next to the Edda platform, which was actively producing oil in the North Sea's Ekofisk oil field. 123 workers, ranging in age from 19 to 57, killed when the platform broke after a severe storm and capsized. What went wrong? Let's find out. Not all offshore drilling platforms are used to extract oil. Even though it was designed as a mobile drilling unit, the Alexander L. Keeland also served as a flottle or lodging platform for staff members of the nearby Edda 27C platform. The rig, which was owned by the Stavanger Drilling Company and leased to Phillips Petroleum at the time of the disaster, was built at a French shipyard and was given the name Alexander Lang Keeland in honor of a Norwegian author. The oil rigs were being hammered on the evening of March 27, 1980, by heavy downpours, waves as high as 12 meters, and gusts as strong as 40 knots. On the Alexander L. Keeland platform, which had been winched away from the production platform, more than 200 personnel were off duty due to the weather. Several survivors claimed to have heard a tremendous blast or crack at around 6.30 in the evening, followed by a trembling. The rig started to list. Exactly what had happened? Only one anchor cable remained after five of them broke, making the rig unstable. A little more than 20 minutes later, the last cable broke, causing the rig to capsize. At this moment, 130 men had assembled in the movie theater and mess hall, which served as emergency meeting places. Four lifeboats were launched in the rush to escape the platform that was capsized, but only one was successfully unhooked from the descending lines. A fifth lifeboat was utilized to rescue survivors after it broke loose from the platform. There were also used a number of life rafts, including two that were tossed from the Edda platform. Others were able to risk the icy water and challenging conditions to swim to the Edda platform, while nearby supply boats were also able to save a few survivors. There were a total of 123 fatalities. Everyone in Norway was stunned by the disaster's news, and Rogaland was especially upset because it was home to the vast majority of the fatalities. At the time, Norway had experienced a number of oil and gas-related incidents, but known on this magnitude. It was became obvious that the sector needed adjustments severely. The commission established to look into the catastrophe came to the conclusion that the disaster's immediate cause was a fatigue fracture in a support brace on one of the platform's columns a year after the tragedy. A crack started as a result of a Poe weld that was missed and grew over time. The research also discovered that if only had a more effective command structure been in place, most passengers on the platform would have had ample time to effectively escape. In response to the investigation, Norway merged the organizations in charge of regulating offshore business. It rendered offshore operators directly accountable for the safety of their workers five years later. New legislation was submitted, including one pertaining to lifeboat release systems. For this industry and all of Norway, the Keeland accident marked a turning point. Since 1980, we've taken a distinct approach to safety. It has been made obvious how the firms are responsible for the government, the regulation structure, and last but not least, how. Every single day, they bear responsibility for safety, according to Anne Meervold, General Director of the Norwegian Petroleum Safety Authority. And now let's dive deeper into the culprit. Was the investigation report accurate? The construction was initially planned as a standalone drill rig with related support facilities for use in a shallow sea environment. Five tubular columns that formed the apices of a pentagonal shape and served as the platform's vertical supports were stabilized on pontoon bases and connected by strong tubular bracing. When the building was put into use, 
it became a flottle that could house several hundred rig workers. The loss of one vertical column caused the rig to become unstable, which in turn caused the entire structure to tilt, which eventually caused inversion and submersion. All of the evidence pointed to a faulty weld bead in a hydrophone tube that had been placed into a sturdy brace with the designation D6 as the cause of the initial failure, which was determined to be a fatigue process. Extreme care was taken to examine the fracture characteristics of the primary failure point, and it was concluded in all the major reports that a progressive cracking in that brace and the ensuing brace separation were what ultimately caused the entire structure to collapse. Concerns about the integrity of the welded joints have always existed in massive welded structures and still do now. What genuine advancements have been made in lowering the likelihood of structural failures, despite increasing attention, worry, and scrutiny from regulatory, insurance, inspection, and governmental bodies. All welds are flawed, after all. Focus on the design, material choice, and welding procedures does result in welds with the desired physical structures and mechanical properties, resulting in the intended component lives in service. Was the weld finished satisfactorily using the noted failure as the targeted example though? Unmistakably, no is the response. According to the report, the way the welder used the SMAW welding procedure was the cause of every weld flaw that was discovered. Clearly, the earliest available information in the investigation supports the conclusion that an appropriate and proper welding method was not followed. In order to focus on a mechanical property test study of the parent carbon steel plate, the writers of the official report disregarded the obvious flaws in weld formation. The mechanical testing of the parent carbon steel was done to make sure the quality was correct and complied with the steel specification. Did the panel consult a skilled welding engineer at this point in the accident investigation? Such expert guidance would have called attention to the weldment flaws of the welded insert joint, to the improper application technique of the SMAW process, and would have questioned the choice of a Class 3 type categorization for the joint. According to the accident report, the presence of paint layers on several of the fracture surfaces was an odd characteristic of the insert weld. The welder was not obliged to perform even a basic visual check of the completed welded junction, as evidenced by this one piece of information alone. All fabrication criteria forbid the presence of crack-like features. These are always categorized as defects and must be eliminated before welding repairs can be made. It follows that no visual inspection was conducted because there was neither proof provided to the panel or any indication that a weld repair attempt had been made. In fillet welds, the toe sites of the welds are frequently where fatigue cracking originates from a surface at points of highest stress. The toe profiles of the fillet at positions P85, P94, and P96 are not blended well and could be favorable sites for crack start and propagation. The hydrogen crack at position P85, however, would be the most likely site candidate. The cyclic stress placed on the joint as a result of forced wave loading is established by the fact that the fatigue fracture spread from the fillet weld. The final accident report did not explicitly mention a collective responsibility for the platform collapse, although the author is of the opinion that it existed. This conclusion is derived from the question, would the rig have failed in the manner it did if the hydrophone insert had been correctly welded to deliver the required optimal weld properties? The safety of people and the success of engineering and building projects can both be seriously compromised by design flaws. The economic, environmental, and societal repercussions of such failures can be catastrophic. Through the application of lessons learned from past tragedies and occurrences, as well as modifications to architectural and engineering norms and standards, significant attempts have been made to lower the incidence of failures. Engineering and construction projects continue to be characterized by design flaws. You can suggest topics you want to see next in the comment section below. Please subscribe to Weather Collapse if you want to know more and be updated on the latest news about natural calamities or disasters happening all over the world and don't forget to like today's video. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.